and Bria Scudder. They were amazing. Um, so I'm going to just say three, three quick things that I feel most um, pleasantly pleased about in this whole process. One, uh, this is a big policy change. And I think a big policy change like this really deserved the two years plus of effort and public conversations that we've had. Uh, we have had public uh, hearings. We have had town hall meetings across the state. We have met with literally hundreds of stakeholders, many of them who we knew would never support the bill. And I believe fully that that makes it a much better outcome. Everybody needs to be at the table when you're making such large change, knowing that their thumbprints are also going to be reflected in there, that it's going to end up to a better way to actually implement the bill when they've actually had a set and had input in the bill. Um, so I'm very pleased that we really did do this in a very thoughtful, deliberative fashion, and that we then could close it because we have a governor who was really supportive and, and behind it and helping us get to closure. Um, the second thing is I'm feeling so pleased that we are finally ending a very failed policy of prohibition that's been in place for yeah. decades. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, actually getting in there and having government tax and regulate is going to improve safety outcomes for our children and hopefully reduce access to them. We know that developing brains should not have access to cannabis. By avoiding it, we don't help that. By actually getting in there and making sure that we're providing safe products and doing good public education around why they should not have access, I think we can improve safety. But even more importantly than that is we can finally start to repair the, the damage that's been done by the war on drugs that you heard Governor Pritzker speak a little bit about. From the beginning, Representative Cassie and I have talked about the three-legged stool uh, that we believe strongly is fundamentally uh, approach to how we needed to legalize cannabis here in Illinois. One, expungement, and make sure that the people who have had their life so disruptive actually have a chance for restoration and getting rid of those charges. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I gotta say, uh, State's Attorney Kim Fox has so been leading the way on that effort. Yeah. stool is that, as Governor Prisker said, one of every four dollars that we get in tax revenue is going to go to those neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. No other state has had those do dollars oh, being directed right. exactly that's to the right. neighborhoods yeah. that deserve it. So I'm yeah. very proud of that. Yeah. And then, while Illinois has been looked at as a model for how well regulated our medical cannabis program is, we have not been a model, nor has any state, on making it a diverse industry. We don't see the diversity of Illinois reflected in the cannabis industry. And so we have taken a lot of measures here to try to ensure that we actually do put in place an industry that is reflective of the state of Illinois and tools to help make sure we get there. I think we're going to become the model legislation now setting the gold standard for how this needs to be done in the future. And we're already seeing us getting picked up by other states and how and looking at how we're going to actually get it passed in our states. So I am very delighted to see that we are I think come year two, three from now, we're going to see a very different cannabis industry here in the state of Illinois. And then the only third point I want to make is something like this that is such significant policy. It's such a collaborative effort. Um, and I just want to do a couple of additional quick thank yous. Um, you know, the senators, uh, Hutchinson, um, I know Senator Lightford, I don't know if she's here or not. She was heavily involved as well as Omar Aquino. And then Senator Barrickman, a Republican colleague, was with us from the start on this. He couldn't be here because of scheduling conflicts. None of this would have happened without their input. Representatives Cassidy, obviously we have been doing this together for over two years. I don't know what I'm going to do without her in my life every day. Um, uh, Rep, uh, leader Jahan Gordon Booth. And we have a uh, new leader, uh, Villanueva, really stepping up and showing what a leader she is. Uh, no, that's what I'm showing. Representative Welter was also there from the beginning, um, and we so appreciate the help. He came with us on trips to Colorado. Sonia Harper, I don't know if she's here. She's been very involved from the beginning. All these representatives, and Representative Morgan, who had been very involved in the medical program and knew how to do it, they've all been incredibly involved. Uh, but then there's been a real core team, four other people that really worked with Ke Kelly and I for over two years, and I just need to acknowledge the four of them. I think Chris Lindsay from Marijuana Policy Project is here, as well as, yeah, and they've been, he just wrote so many drafts and worked with us nonstop on actually getting things right and helping us compare across other states. We hope now he takes us forward and tells other states how to do it. Um, Rose Ashby, I know, is here. Is you can hear, you can hear the re 
impeach Rose's hat by that, because she really has been keeping everybody together on this bill. And then Pete Peroni and Kareem Kenyatta were there every step of the way with us. I don't know. I know they're here someplace. Uh, and with that, to call it an end to just say I'm very much looking forward to now uh, staying at the table. We know this is just the beginning. Uh, it's a big, thick bill. We know we didn't get everything right. Uh, we know we want to make work the improved safety and the improved restorative aspects of taxing and regulating cannabis is now being the law in Illinois, and we'll be continuing to be at the table to make sure it works right. Thank you. And now uh, my colleague in arms here, Kelly Cassidy. Every day. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're geeky friends, so this is how we have fun. Uh, so more than six years ago, I got a call um, from a lawyer from the Marijuana Policy Project, and Heather just mentioned him, uh, Chris Lindsay. He had a bold idea, and he and, and Pete Baroni pitched this idea for a path towards legalization for the state of Illinois. We actually thought it was probably going to take about seven years. Um, so we're ahead of schedule. Um, I want to thank Chris uh, for their confidence in me to start this process so long ago, uh, the team that we built, uh, the access to your literal walking encyclopedia of cannabis law and your seeming ability to write all night uh, as we needed drafts uh, done over and over again. Uh, so, so thank you to you guys for, for starting this journey with me. Um, my sisters, Heather and Toy and Jahan, uh, these last two and a half years um, seem like both a blink and a lifetime. And Selena, you <laughs> folded into our very strange dynamic, finding us dressing alike and finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> but, but, you're, but it's happening. Um, and you really, you just parachuted in and uh, really cemented my belief that this year's new class is uh, something quite magical. Um, so thank you for, for, for your work. Um, Everyone that hosted a town hall, shared an idea, and even voiced their opposition. You made this a better bill, and you made me a better legislator, so I want to thank you. Um, and my car and its 50,000 miles does not thank you. Um, so we're going we're gonna to give the little car a break. Um, I'm going to say it again. You could probably say it with me. What a difference a governor makes. This team hit the ground running with a bold plan. Sometimes we wondered if we had enough runway. Um, your team is amazing. Christian, I miss you in the chamber, um, but I'm grateful for our continued partnership. And I said it in my clothes uh, on, the, on the House floor. You know, this, this governor and his team jumped in the boat with us, grabbed an oar, and helped us bring this boat to shore. And I am so grateful that this, this is where we are. Heather's right, when we were leaving Albany, we knew that the difference between what we had accomplished and what they weren't going to accomplish was the closer. So thank you. Yes. Rose, everybody talks about the marijuana moms. And they talk about the four of us, but they don't talk about you, the other marijuana mom. Um, your endless patience and dedication to this, I thank you. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do about without you in my life every day either. Um, you know, we've all been going through withdrawals these last couple of weeks without meeting each other at 7:30 in the morning. Um, this bill is not perfect. It's not the end of the conversation. We've often noted that every year there are several alcohol-related bills uh, debated in our in our chamber. This continues, but today we're hitting the reset button on the war on drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Today, we begin the process of undoing the harm of the war on drugs. It's not a one-stop shop here. We begin this process, and I pledge to you that I'm here until it's all done. I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, and thank you, Governor. Now I have the great honor of bringing up my sister, my sister in bed assery, as we like to say. <laughs> Majority Leader Jahan Gordon Booth. The feeling is so real. What cannibal what cannabis legalization has meant in this country before today 
was that wealthy white men would get rich yeah. and black men would get arrested. Yeah. Right. They would get arrested, they would be incarcerated, and they would be forced to live in permanent second class citizenship because of convictions and forced to face those collateral consequences everywhere they went, everywhere that they lived, and anywhere they tried to send their children to school. That's changing because of this bill today. What we are doing here is about reparations. Mm, this is about this is about repairing harm. Harm that's been done to communities for the last 40 years as a part of the failed war on drugs. And after 40 years of treating entire communities like criminals, here comes this multi-billion dollar industry, and guess what? Black and brown people have been put at the very center of this policy in a way that no other state in the country has ever done this before. Legalization in Illinois doesn't look like it looks anywhere in the country because the men and women that you see standing up here today, we fought for you. Mm. We see you and we fought for you, which is why you are at the center of this policy. And this is not the end, this is just the beginning because the fight has really just gotten started. This is about every single one of you here in the state of Illinois who has felt delayed, who has felt rejected, who has felt castigated to the sidelines because of a choice. This is about economic justice. This is about criminal justice reform. This is about reparations. Mm. This is about a new chapter. A new chapter for Illinois, a new chapter for black communities, a new chapter for communities of color all across this state. And we are leading not just in this state, but in this country. We would not be here today if it were not for the leadership of the governor's office and their amazing team. Um, enough can't be said about them or to them. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to thank my colleagues, my fellow legislators, who rolled up their sleeves and put in the hard work to get this thing done. We're not just beginning. We're not just, we are not finished. We are just beginning. But let's take a moment and recognize, ladies and gentlemen, we made history. Yeah, yeah. We made history. <laughs> okay, got a little side beside myself. So coming up to the stage is, is my sister, not just in the legislature, she is my daughter's godmother, we are roommates, we talked about marijuana every day until one o'clock in the morning and woke up again at six a.m. in the morning and talked about cannabis again. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. We talked about it, talked about it, talk, just talk, <laughs> just talk, just talk. <laughs> my sister, Senator Toy Hutchinson. John Gordon Booth always says, I don't like talking after you, Toy. I don't even say after that. <laughs> um, I, there's, so many, there's so many people to thank, and everybody's done that. I think I just want to start off by saying I am so proud to be able to have a, a, an instance in a legislative career that I know almost never comes. That's right. That you get to be a part of, of, of crafting and shaping a policy that is going to change the direction of the state for generations to come. Yeah, that this right wasn't it. about the next election. This was about the next generation yes. of people. Because we know, we know. And so to be, to be a part of that, to be in in spaces where you have to roll up your sleeves and get in and talk to people who do not agree with you, and show up in communities to folks who are worried and afraid about this, and answer folks who look like me who I wanted to benefit from this, who didn't believe me. Mm. 
and to do it in the face of it because I thought it was the right thing to do. We thought it was the right thing to do. There was no mandate telling me and Jahan, on behalf of all black, come do this. <laughs> there was nobody, there was nobody pushing us like this. As a matter of fact, and lots of times it was exactly the opposite. But we did it because we believed it was the right thing to do. Anything about the way the current system is today. If there's anybody who believes that we need to fight to keep the current system as it is it today. Right? And I say this about almost any other major issue we deal with in the state. If you are fighting to keep it exactly the way it is, that must mean it's working for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was working for us. <laughs> so I knew in my heart and in my soul, A, that I needed to go to sleep and my family needed to know who they thought I was. They needed to know that I am who they think I am. I needed to wake up in the morning and know that my family and people I care about and the people I've represented would see and be able to understand who I am. And who I am is somebody that will stand in the middle of the arena when it's hard. A lot of people want this title because the title itself is sexy. <laughs> However, the work that goes into doing this work is not. It's hard. It is, it is sometimes against the grain. It is, it is in the face of people who are looking at you saying, you're nothing but a liar, a crook, a thief. You're trying to take stuff from us. We don't believe you. We don't trust you. We don't like politicians anyway. You do that in the face of this. So right now, I'm standing here knowing that because we were in the room, because we were in the room, right on that there will be people who look back and see what we said and what we did and they will debate it and they will talk about it and they will write about it and it will be the foundation for what happens next. There's no way to normalize this without starting somewhere. And we're starting in a place that is the biggest bite at this that any state has ever seen. So if we want to get to the point where we see the equity we, we are fighting for, if you want to get to the point where you see the diversity in the industry that we're fighting for, if you want to see people be able to re rebuild their lives and have fresh starts and be able to make a difference in the communities they live in because they're no longer calcified in poverty, as my sister John says, you have to start someplace. This was a hell of a start. And if you have a public health concern, there's a reason we're here. If you have a criminal justice concern, there's a reason why we're here. And there's a reason why it was no longer possible for us to look at where we stand right now and think that this system was good for anybody, anywhere, at any time, unless it was working for you. So we knew in those moments, as I would say very eruditely to newspapers and press, that we are not going to codify the inequity that exists in the medical industry right now as we normalize and legalize this process. Yes, that's, right. how, yes. that's how you say it. That's how you say it for print. Right, that's how you say it for print. What you say when you're in the room really negotiates is it ain't going down like that. Right. Right. <laughs> and so we put our heart and our soul and our whole guts on the line on this because it was the right thing to do. I cannot tell you how proud I am of that one thing. So thank you all for being here. I don't have my fan, because y'all know I'll be fanning at the podium. <laughs> but I will say, I know what it's like to, to go through entire years of sessions where it's intense, but no work gets done. And to have ended this session in the historic fashion that we did, with the heavy lifts that we did, with all the people that are standing behind me right now, led by a governor who people at the beginning did not think could do this. You better ask somebody. That's right. You better ask somebody. Because that's what happened in this session right now. We ended a truly historic session with major accomplishments and major work. I had I, to stand on the floor at the end of session and see Democrats hugging Republicans, Republicans hugging Democrats, and we had an on-time, balanced budget, bipartisan, like you can say that in a sense, on-time, balanced, bipartisan budget. At the same time that we did cannabis legalization and Reproductive Health Act and all, I mean like it was an incredible session. Because we elected an incredible governor who put his money where his mouth was, put his feet where his beliefs were, and believed that if he trusted those of us in the legislature to get this done, he could trust us to do that. 
That is incredible. And I am so glad I'm in office to see it. Because that's what co-equal branches of government can do when you really believe in something. So thank you, Governor Pritzker. Thank you, Sister in Arms, Juliana Stratton. Thank you, Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell. My sisters, who I FaceTime in the morning because it's weird not to talk to you every morning. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have makeup on, my hair's not done, and I just felt like, what you doing? Are you getting ready? Where are we going? <laughs> because it, it was that intense. But I know one thing. These women that I got to work with, I wouldn't want to be in any other battle and any other fight without those women next to me. We walked into battle and came out victors. Right. Thank you. Now, 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 I would like to bring to the stage <laughs> Representative Villanueva. All right, so I, I can't like come after you both. Like that's just ridiculous. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to, to really thank the governor, first of all, because I think I need like a frequent miles program or something with how often we've seen each other in the past week. Um, because I think this is what, fourth time, I think, in the past seven days. Um, but th that also means that we've truly done some really great things. Um, I want, you know, to be a freshman legislator, and again, I'm going on a full year of service as of next month. Uh, and to be given the opportunity to join the ranks of the people up here of the badass women who really took the reins on this and made it their own and really centered equity and justice, you know, and put it at the center of everything. You know, I want to thank Representative Cassidy, uh, Senator Staines, Leader Gordon Booth, and Senator Hutchinson for letting me par be part of the team and letting me add my voice to this historic bill and for being such staunch advocates for our state because it isn't just like our communities, it's the entire state of Illinois. You are all the women that I want to be when I grow up. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I also want to give a big shout out to the governor and his staff, Bria Martin, Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell, the House staff, the Senate staff, all, everyone that was behind the scenes, the advocates that did so much amazing work and that were around this table consistently and constantly when some of us were popping off all the time, <laughs> myself included, to ensure that all of our voices were being heard because that's what equity looks like. It's an honor to stand here today, not just as one of the chief co-sponsors of this bill and soon to be law, as soon as the governor gets over there and signs it, <laughs> I stand here as a representative of a largely Latino Latinx district on the southwest side of the city of Chicago, including the southwest suburbs. I am also the representative of a district that encompasses Cook County Jail, so when I say that this issue is personal, it's personal. When I was appointed to fill this seat, I did so knowingly with the responsibility of my community on my shoulders, that there have been injustices that have unfortunately plagued my community for a very, very long time. Thank you for shushing people. See, this morning, with the legalization of adult use cannabis, and more specifically, the expungement of so many records, we will bring some justice to the communities that have been hardest hit by its senseless prohibition. Communi communities that have been overly criminalized because of its prohibition, and a failed war on drugs that only further marginalized communities that instead needed support and investment. This monumental step forward shows what's possible when public policy is centered around equity every freaking step of the way. <laughs> and these incredible chief sponsors and the people up here that were on this bill, that worked on this bill, demonstrate not just equity, but a love for our communities and for our state. This bill is the beginning of so, uh, for the beginning for so many people because it's going to allow us to repair some of the damage. I'm not saying all of the damage because it's going to be a long time and a long hard battle to continue to do the work that we're doing. I'm saying that some of it, some of the damage that's been caused by the war on drugs, it's also going to create new opportunities of investment in our communities who have been victims to these unjust policies. With 25% of the revenue from taxing of cannabis going towards restoring, reinvesting, and renewing these same communities who have often been neglected and that for me is one of the biggest wins 
in addition, actually creating the Cannabis Business Development Fund, which is going to provide low interest business, business loans to social equity applicants. These are things that we fought hard for, and they're not sexy, but they deserve all the credit for the work that was done, and they deserve all of the attention. The other thing that I want to bring up, and this is, this is truly the reason why. Less than a month after I was appointed, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. The institution that has treated her so well and treated her, her disease is a Catholic institution. Because of that, she wasn't able to apply for the medical cannabis program. She is one of many people throughout this state and many people throughout this country that could not find relief within the cannabis program. And that's something that I carry with me every single day. I did this for her. For those people that unfortunately fall outside of that program that don't want to be on opioids in order to help the symptoms of their diseases. I did this for her and for so many people that have given so much to this country and deserve the minimum amount for us to spend endless nights, late nights, ensuring that we pass policy that's gonna help improve their lives. This is what equity looks like, y'all. Thank you. And now it's my honor to represent, to, to represent, to present Representative Walter. Great job. My name is Representative David Welter. I represent the 75th District, about 60 miles southwest of here, just at the edge of the suburbs. To some, it might seem unlikely for a Republican to be a chief co-sponsor on adult cannabis recreational legalization, but it shouldn't. In fact, this should be a model for future states looking forward to legalizing. I'm proud to stand up here with my colleagues for the signing of this historic legislation. Governor Pritzker, you and your team helped lead the negotiations. You were inclusive, you listened, and you were open, open to differing ideas, and I appreciate that. Senator Staines, Representative Cassidy, for the last two years, I have had the pleasure of working with both of you, whether it's traveling, meetings in Chicago or Springfield. When things got difficult, you pulled us back together. You two are both truly amazing folks. When I look at the data, it's clear. Prohibition does not work. Cannabis arrests... Cannabis arrests and convictions have disproportionately impacted minority communities. This legislation can never right the wrongs of our past, but it can help provide the needed resources for the building of a better future for Illinoisans across our entire state. There will be some growing pains, just as talked about earlier. We will need some follow-up legislation as we work through this newly regulated market. But I look forward to working together with all of you on this stage to ensure that we address those issues when they come up in the future for many years to come to continue to make the best policy possible for the state of Illinois. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next, I'd like to introduce State's Attorney Kim Fox. I'm going to go fast uh, because we're melting. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's already been said before, but it does bear repeating. This bill is revolutionary, revolutionary in its work to right the wrongs of a failed war on drugs. The time for justice is now, especially for communities of color who have long been disproportionately impacted by low-level cannabis convictions. The legislation will provide conviction relief for hundreds of thousands of people here in the state of Illinois. And 
which is why I am proud that I pushed for the broadest, most equitable form of conviction relief possible. So I will answer the question that many will ask. Not that question. <laughs> why is a prosecutor at the center of pushing for conviction and equity uh, and relief for the hundreds of thousands? Because there were prosecutors who implemented these convictions. There were legislators who pushed for bills, who pushed for legislations that disproportionately impacted our community. The responsibility is not left upon those who were impacted to right the wrongs. As a prosecutor who oversees the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, it was my obligation to have a seat at the table and make sure that the work that my office and offices like mine across the state have done to inflict harm were there to repair the harm that we caused. <laughs> that is my obligation as a prosecutor, to seek justice. This bill does just that. Now that this bill will be signed very, very shortly, my office can start moving forward to vacate these low-level convictions. I once again want to thank this governor for having the courage and the leadership to not only say that he would sponsor the bill, but sign his name to the vacating of these convictions. There is no other governor in this country who is willing to take that risk like this governor did. And I'm so very proud. At this time, because we're almost there, <laughs> I'd like to bring to the stage the leader of the Cabrini Green Legal Aid Foundation, Esther Franco Payne.